one day she was at our apartment and she had a seizure in the in our apartment. She had a seizure and she died. She literally oh, died in the in the apartment. So immediately after her death, we heard we heard this mm-hmm. loud knocking, loud knocking at the front door. We heard loud knocking. We'd open the door and there'd be no one there. We heard loud knocking on the walls, loud knock or a knock on the window. Late at night, it'd be a knock on the window. We was go. it one one off one time? Oh no no no! Repeated, it was repeated. days. It it continued wow, for really? it continued for days after Holy that shit. knocking. And my dad didn't believe in that kind of stuff. But I'll tell yeah. you what, I'll never forget his face when we were sitting in the living room watching TV and there was a loud banging on the door right. and he got up, he had this weird look and he opened the door and there was no one there. And I look Man. at my dad, I look at my dad's face and he was kind of a tough guy. Right, except for probably my sleep. Is it Bodon? Bodan, yes, yes, Bodan? that's how it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you mispronounce it to a certain degree, that's no problem. Okay. So that's all right. Well, thanks for doing it, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I'm thanks excited. I, I I was so excited when I got your message. I'm like, wow, from Ukraine. Really? Yes. That's, yes, that's yes. wild. Podcasting so. has finally reached my country. In fact, it's admittedly come here. I think, you know, realistically, surely later than to the US, right? Mm-hmm. But this whole genre is developing pretty rapidly here as well. Have you used the uh, Zencaster platform before? I have never. Yeah. Okay. But well, that's interesting because the platform that we matched on, um, it's fairly popular. You know what's surprising to me? How hosts reach out to podcast, how, how rather guests reach out to podcast hosts mm-hmm. and not vice versa. You know, because I am used to reaching out to people, inviting them on, and now I got like a lot of unread messages from guests. Yes. Yeah. So that's interesting. So tell me, what's your experience with that platform been like? Uh, it's been really positive. I've I've had a, a good response with uh, podcasters, you know, reaching out to me, and uh, I've gotten good response back from uh, podcasters that I've reached out to. Mm-hmm. So I really I really enjoy it. Um, I yeah. think it's a, been a really good uh, vehicle for me to um, connect with others. You know, doing pod. This is all new yeah. to me. Yeah, really. How long have you been into it with the platform specifically? How many appearances have you had? Um, I've had about 11 or 12, and that's within the past probably six months, seven months. Wow, interesting. Yeah, Yeah, and I haven't even really been pushing hard at it. You know, if Mm. I I really send out a lot of messages, I think I'd probably even get more response. So do you normally like make the steps sometimes towards the host so is it usually do you get invited or do you um offer to the host to um it's kind of balanced it's a mix um a lot of times uh, responses i send out uh, i i will usually get responses back and then some um podcasters just saw uh, saw my profile and then they just reach out and said hey we're you know we're looking for guests and you sound like you'd be interesting Right, that's cool. And that appears to be a rather new platform. I don't think I've heard of that before. Do you know? I, I mm-hmm. think it's a fairly yeah, new. I think so. so. I, um, you know, I'm so new to this. Um, I don't think they've been around a long time. Mm-hmm. Now, when you are on a certain podcast to people who may not have heard, how do you usually introduce yourself? How do you speak of your like credentials? Um, in yeah, I just speak a little occupation? bit. Yeah, a little bit of my background um, and uh, what got me interested in yeah. in ancient mysteries. Uh, I, I go over a little bit of that um, and then just get right into my book. Um, okay. Usually it's pretty organic. I mean, usually it's just a basic introduction, a little bit about, you know, about my background, and then we just jump right into it. But I try to be real flexible depending upon, you know, what the, what the show's looking for and mm-hmm. just kind of roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So what got you into the search of mysteries is uh, your pre- pretty much forever fascination with something mysterious, right? You know, yeah. Funny. From the time I was a young boy um, there, this was back in the eighties, there was a television program on called in search of, and it was hosted by Leonard Nimoy. I don't know if you've heard of him. 
Nope. And he was uh, Spock in the, uh, yeah. he played Spock in the Star Trek series and science oh, fiction series. that guy. Series, that sure. guy. Yeah. yeah. Was and, he the only one? I don't think anybody portrayed that character ever since. I don't. I, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think any any other other actor has. Mm-hmm. But he hosted this show, and you know, the, it talked about ancient mysteries, talked about Atlantis, UFOs, that type of thing, and it, it, that stuff was always fascinating to me. And I would check out books at the school library on that, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, just from the time I was young, I, I had an interest in that, and it and it just carried over into adulthood. And uh, I, I traveled overseas quite a bit. I traveled over to Europe and traveled to Mexico and been to some of the pyramids over there the um well some people say oh these are Aztec pyramids but the Aztecs even said when the conquistadors went over there like we didn't build these like these were here before our people were here but Mm -hmm. I've just always been you know fascinated with Mm -hmm. ancient mysteries and you've probably managed to take that childhood fascination into the adulthood and that's a rather rare thing right so what do you think what do you think helped you not to lose that child ch- child spark curiosity know, curiosity because yeah. a lot of people lose it right a it's lot of people lose it company. yeah yeah a lot of people lose it um to me it's just a, a curiosity i have a very curious mind and uh always wanting to learn and i just i've known since the time i was a young boy that there are just so many things out there that we just don't fully understand and i think there's a lot of missing chapters in our history and the more I looked into it and the more I studied it, the, the more um, questions that I had. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say curiosity, just continue to learn and, you know, being curious and uh, doing a lot of self-study. Mm-hmm. Okay, I clearly remember my obsession with those ch- ch- children's encyclopedias, how uh-huh. rich with pictures they were. And oh, each yeah. time I, I read some some story that was out of this conventional science kind of thing is normally it's like, oh, let's learn physics, let's learn chemistry, mm-hmm. let's learn that, and then bam, UFOs, right? Uh, snowman yeah. or whatever, you, how do you call Abominable it? Abominable snowman, yeah. Yeah, 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 but that, like Sasquatch, right? The yeah. Sasquatch, is that, is it, is it like a local term for the Americans, Sasquatch? It, it, it is, the Native American people, actually most of the different tribes have different names oh, for yeah. them, but yeah. Sasquatch is kind of a common one, and I think it means like hairy man, but mm. in, in the area where I live, in Washougal, Washington, it, there is tons of uh, Bigfoot sightings. Really? All over, all over in Washington yeah. and, and, and Oregon is right across the river oh. and they have tons of Bigfoot sightings as well. So, and it's the vicinity is rather like mountain, right? It's kind of, it's not flat, is it? Uh, right. Have forested. Yeah. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. 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 So a lot of territory a... that's not been, that is not commonly explored, you would say, because I'm fascinated with those places where people don't often reach. Now, obviously everything's been sort of. Um, explored and started but is there a lot of places in where you live where people don't often you know stick around yeah there are some very remote areas as far as heavily forested areas that you just don't have many people uh going out in those areas Mm -hmm. yeah we, we have a lot of those areas oh that's nice that's beautiful you know so have you ever gone to any have you ever been to any of those places nearby you where people are not uh, common guests um, all around me are, are wooded areas. We have a number of rivers. Um, there's a lot of people that, that do hiking and stuff out here. So I would say um, probably not very remote areas that I've been to because it's just so so many people get out and out into the nature and you always see backpackers and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. It's nice to live next to a place that's always preserved something mysterious rather, right? Like, you know, Oh my gosh, there, there's so much. And in my book, um, I, I just wrote a book and it's called the red haired giants of Lovelock right. cave and other ancient mysteries. And that book actually covers a lot of different subjects. Now it doesn't yeah. focus just on giants, but it also mm-hmm. covers uh, the elongated skull people mm-hmm. of Peru. I'm not sure how familiar you are with them. Um, you know, they had the real long skulls and uh, very unusual looking. Some of the skulls look, they don't even look like they're 
they're homo sapien. They're, mm -hmm. It's just so elongated. Yeah, and, I think I might have seen some picture in those cars. They look like those characters from the Alien film. Is that what it remotely yes, Yes, yeah. Like and what's, yeah. And what's very fascinating is I have a section in my book um, on those elongated skull people. And there's an area in Peru called Paracas that has a lot of these elongated skulls. Now, in a lot of different cultures, uh, they would artificially elongate the skulls. Mm. They would put like when their when their child was a baby, they would take a board and they would put the baby wow. on the their head on the board, and then they would they would bind it to the board. So when the when the skull grew, it actually elongated wow. artificially and why what was the reason behind that so that's a very good question and there's i mean this ancient sumerians practice of uh, cranial deformation the native americans did um egypt some of the egyptians did and wow. even over in your area around the black sea there were those people that had the elongated skulls now the question is and this is fascinating well why would all these people from different parts of the world that some of them didn't even have contact with each other what what is it about yeah. you know making your head look so different yeah. like why would yeah. you take your child well, let me guess so yeah. it appears as if some sort of perhaps uh, desire to copy somebody or something that must have visited per them per precisely precisely and and you know there's a debate on what that what that something was yeah. was it extraterrestrials that that had that appearance that maybe had advanced technology into these uh, these peoples, they would think of them as gods mm -hmm. because of their su superior technology, or was it just a very advanced civilization that was from mm -hmm. this world, this planet, that was a seafaring culture that traveled a lot of places that had influence on these cultures, and some people might use the term Atlantis, that type of civilization mm -hmm. that was advanced, but then they were they were wiped out. And there were remnants of them, and they would try to pass on knowledge to these different cultures. I think mm -hmm. Graham Hancock talks a lot about that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sh sure if you're familiar with, yeah, sure. with Graham Hancock. He talks about it. He uses a term. In fact, one of his books was called Fingerprints of the Gods. Mm -hmm. And that was his yeah. whole premise, that there was an advanced civilization that left their fingerprints mm -hmm. in all these different cultures. And does he precisely speak of aliens, of uh, alien civilization? Uh, not so much. Uh, Graham not Hancock's not so much. He doesn't go down that path. He, th he thinks it was an advanced civilization that was from the earth. You know, mm. where, where other other researchers would say, oh, they, you know, they came they came from, mm -hmm. you know, from from another planet. Those territory of the Amazon forest, I've heard recently there was one appearance on Rogan's podcast of one guy who, I mean, might have been Graham Hancock, I don't remember, but probably somebody mm -hmm. else who basically said that below that surface, it's like the whole country, perhaps not even one, you know, uh, and if you go underground, you would discover this underground caves and some sort of structure looking almost buildings yeah you know? so it's very interesting it come from it's very interesting now, yeah um so what is because you know there are normally like two sides to each story and what yes. about those prolongated scars do we know do we have any like conventional side of the metal like what's the conventional explanation yeah the conventional explanation is that the, that all of the elongated skulls, they were, uh, it was from cranial deformation, which means mm -hmm. artificially elongated. Mm -hmm. Now, in the area of Paracas, Peru, there are skulls there that do not appear to have been artificially elongated. They're, they're mm -hmm. that way naturally. And some medical mm -hmm. doctors have looked at the skulls and they noticed that there's a, a part on the back of the skull called the sagittal suture that we have as Homo sapiens that these particular skulls they didn't have a sagittal suture oh. so so yeah so even if even if they were artificial artificially elongated they should still have the sagittal suture however yeah. some of these skulls do not have the sagittal suture would that possibly mean that they not necessarily didn't necessarily belong to human homo sapiens as our it's species? it's pr precisely oh, that's it and there's and what some, year are we talking about again um, these go back several thousand years. Uh, yeah. Some of these skulls have dated back, yeah, several thousand years. In fact, there were some skulls that actually had two holes in the back of the skull, oh. and um, and some of these doctors were looking at it, going, "What? What is that? What would be yeah. the purpose?" And there was a doctor that said he believed that those holes were evolutionary 
purpose and that the reason why those holes were in the back of the skull is because the head was so large that mm. those those holes helped with the circulate the blood in the mm. skull because it was so it was so big it was so large and the interesting thing is there was dna testing done on some of these skulls and they found and these this is in peru and some of the skulls had patches of red hair on the skulls now there's the native peoples over there in peru they don't have red hair hmm. they don't and so they did dna testing and it determined that they some of the dna was of european origin hmm. and asian origin and they hmm. actually traced it back to the black sea area which is in hmm. which is ukraine hmm. russia bulgaria romania turkey hmm. you know um that these, this particular group of people that had these elongated skulls that were mm -hmm. that way naturally, they ended up migrating. For some reason, they were pushed out of the area of the Black Sea, and they made it all the way to Peru. That's wild. That's crazy. You know, I've always been obsessed with thinking about how people back in the day, how would they just gather and sail away? They didn't even know where they were going. Right. Yeah. Like they had Google Maps or something. Something, something must have forced them so badly. Something must have been so bad for them that they just went for nowhere. That's what's wild. Exactly. Wild. Exactly. Have you heard of the Nazca mummies? No, I don't think I have. Okay. So when you get a chance, I'd encourage you to look into the Nazca mummies. Mm -hmm. Now these come out of Peru as well, and they were first. Uh, uh, brought out to the public in 2017 mm -hmm. and they're these mummies and some of them have of course the elongated heads however mm -hmm. uh, the first one that was revealed to the public um is a, a mummy with a long head huge eye sockets um mm -hmm. no nose no ears three fingers on each hand and Holy i believe shit. and i believe three toes on each foot and it was covered in a white powder um, mm -hmm. which uh, which archaeologists believe it was it helped kind of preserve the preserve the body mm -hmm. and there's other and mummies. that comes from Peru it comes from Peru mm -hmm. the Nazca Nazca region of Peru which have you heard of the Nazca lines no Okay, oh, Nazca no. lines are those huge glyphs over there on the ground that go for miles, and you yeah. have to actually be up in the air. You have to be yeah. flying like a, in a helicopter or airplane to actually look and see what those glyphs are, you know, from the air to see what they are on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's in that region. It's a very mysterious uh part of peru mm -hmm. and anyway these mummies that were brought forward they've done dna testing they've done bone scans and they they've been studying these since 2017 and they've determined that they aren't hoaxes it wasn't like mm -hmm. someone took some animal bones and mixed them with human bones and tried to create these really unusual looking mummies um there's no evidence of that and in How fact how tall was that skeleton is it approximately of human height the the first one that was revealed is yes is is yeah. is hu you know human height probably average human height but the, there's other mummies that have been found um, that are small some of them are very small, small. do you know small. you know the term gray aliens gray yes. the grays yeah. some yeah. of them look exactly like grays with the elongated head skinny mm -hmm. little bodies mm -hmm. skinny little long arms mm -hmm. right some of them look reptilian almost like a hybrid between a homo sapien and a reptilian just of a wild. yeah and they've been nice. studying these things since 2017 and they have not yeah. been able to debunk them no now, explanation right no no no, no. conventional stances of to what the hell that was no and the, and the dna shit. testing the dna testing on some of them shows um that some of them have um you know human dna but there are some of them that have elements of dna that are is in no known species on the planet oh, unidentified wow. unidentified you know, I've, I've been half jokingly like i'd like to have jokingly ask people what they would be more afraid of uh mm -hmm. encounter like a tall creature of some sort mm -hmm. of alien yeah. uh, origin or a small one you know and i yeah. think strangely to me i would be more afraid of something kind of smaller because you kind know it's like those and that's why i'd like to eventually get into that topic of how do you call it those little people from of native american i talk legends. yeah that's how i write yeah. about those in my book yeah man because encountering something that would remotely remind some uh, resemble some like human like but much much smaller that would be creepy and you know not to offend anybody who's been yeah. born like that but yeah. holy shit, i mean getting into something like taller that's one thing but seeing 
like that kind of gray alien type, that would be scary as hell. You know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Have you heard of the Flores Hobbit? Have you heard of that term? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. I've heard of a similar story. I'm going to tell you the similar story sure. that happened somewhere. Man, I wish I could remember. It happened in somewhere, either in my country or in Poland somewhere, okay. from this alien called Alosha. Alosha alien, you might have heard about it. It's one mm -hmm. lady, basically. Well, I'm going to get into that later. And yeah. I think later that there was this debunked. But for longest time, it was like uh, the famous story of human, you know, interacting. Because that was this goddamn lady. She found a creature, a really like human, like a baby looking creature that mm -hmm. didn't quite, didn't really sort of qualify as human because of mm -hmm. certain deformities and stuff. Yeah, but late, and she kind of, she, the lady was a little bit unhealthy psychologically. So she was taking care of that creature. She got really, I think she had had issues with not being able to birth babies. So she became really emotionally attached to that. And then one, one time that creature just disappeared. And there were a lot of speculation that the government got a hold of that thing for the study and, and stuff. But then later, at least that's what Wikipedia says, it was kind of uh, proven to be uh, like a human baby that was born with certain deformities due to radiation or something like mm. that. But still a crazy story, you know, that made yeah. a lot of noise. That's wild. That's a wild, That's wild funny. story. But there was an archaeological discovery uh, in the early 2000s on the Isle of Flores in Indonesia. There was a, a giant cave there, and archaeologists were doing an excavation. It's called Liang Bao Cave, huge cave system. And they found this little skeleton. They found this tiny skull. And in fact, um, hang on just a second. I want to show you. I have a replica of it. I'm going to grab it real quick. Shit. Okay, come on. Bring it. Okay, so this is a replica of the Flores Hobbit. This is the exact replica oh of of the of the skull Holy that was found. So wow. it's very very small. It's very mm. small. And when archaeologists first discovered it, um, they and then they found the the skeletal remains. They thought because it was under four feet tall, it wasn't even four okay. feet tall, and they thought. They thought, well, maybe it's a child, or mm -hmm. or maybe it, it it has that that person. It's a female, and maybe it, maybe she had some disease that would make mm -hmm. her small. But then they did the genetic testing that on the bones, and they determined that it wasn't a disease. And mm -hmm. and the the skeleton had the wisdom teeth in there, so mm -hmm. it was an adult. It was an mm -hmm. adult female, and so not even yeah, not even four feet tall, less than four feet mm -hmm. tall. And then they found artifacts. They found spear points. They found, mm -hmm. um, you know, other artifacts. They started finding other uh, bones and remains in this cave. And they determined that mm -hmm. this was a race of, of people, little people, not oh, more shit. than four feet tall, that, that, that once walked the earth. Whoa. And they were smart. They knew how to make fire. They knew how to make uh -huh. weapons. They found. And they the, discovered that when? What, what year? Uh, in the early this? two early two thousands. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the the paleoanthropologist um, they gave the name Flores Hobbits. They named the Hobbits oh. after J. R. Tolkien. You know, the right, Hobbits, right, right. Lord of the Rings. You know, because that story was about these legendary and were, little people. What, what, wasn't that race later wiped out by somebody else? I might have heard something like it, that. It's it very, it, and that's probably what happened. You're probably right. Uh, they obviously they were around. Um, now there's there's different opinions on on when they died out. Like when I first started researching it for my book, I heard some estimates that they were around as little as. 13,000 years ago. Mm. And now, you know, other, other, uh, archeologists are saying, Oh, they probably died out about 60,000 years ago, mm -hmm. but either way, you know, however far back, whether it was 13,000 years ago or maybe 60,000 years ago, mm -hmm. I believe they had interaction with our, our ancestors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so it's very possible and very likely that they could have been killed off, you know, just because mm -hmm. they were very small, and you know what happens when different cu cultures come in contact mm -hmm. with each other. You know, a lot of times there is yeah. is conflict. Mm -hmm. and, um, conflict, that's, the kind of diseases, viruses. And disease, exactly. Yeah, look what happened to the Native Americans when the first mm -hmm. pioneers came over here to the United States 
and they brought a lot of diseases and it wiped out uh, most now, of Now, do you it, accept for, for a second that some kind of remnants might have been saved of those people, like somehow miraculously somebody might have gotten around? Absolutely. I, I okay. definitely believe that because just like with the, the stories of the giants and all these different cultures, you also have stories of the little people, especially in the Native American tribes. Most okay. Native American tribes will, t will have stories in their oral traditions about these little people. And I talk about them in my book. There's, there's different, there's some people, some of the little people were called the moon eyed people. And they had allegedly had big eyes and very pale skin mm -hmm. and they couldn't go out in the direct sunlight and they lived underground. They lived in, mm. in caves or they, you know, and they would only come out at night. Oh man. Yeah. I've just finished recently this book. What is the name of that book? I wish I could remember it. Uh, somewhere. You know, uh, I don't remember the name of that book, but that, that's one of those classical English horror writers. And he had the, his whole, premise was centered around those little people you know and he would write exactly something like that how uh that, that was this story that kind of re resonates with me what you've been just saying about those people coming out at night and leaving some kind of traces it's just like what 19th century english horror right yeah and obviously not anyhow scientifically based but still amazing how because you know it's all part of folklore and we i don't think we should easily dis discard what folklore gives us Right. Absolutely. I think behind every myth, behind every legend, there's a kernel of truth. There's something mm -hmm. of truth that those legends came from. In fact, when I was writing my book, I, I was researching a lot of old newspaper articles uh, here in North America. And not only did I find a lot of articles on the discovery of giant skeletons here in North America, but I also started coming across articles on little people discoveries, mm -hmm. particularly in the area of uh, Tennessee over here in the United States. And a lot of the native tribes have a heavy um, tradition that there were these little people and, mm -hmm. and, and some of the tribes fought with them. Mm -hmm. Some of these little people, some of them were nice and some of the little people were, were evil. Oh, shit. Yeah. Would you want, probably deep down, you would love to encounter yourself personally with something like that, right? Just to have some kind of firsthand. You know, that would be amazing. I actually yeah. met someone on a podcast. She was a, she was a podcast host. She had an encounter with oh, yeah. a little person. And l let me really? tell you about it. It was, it was unusual. <laughs> She's from, uh, from Texas. And she told me that one day she was walking in kind of a wooded area with her, her niece, who was a, uh, a young girl and they're going through these woods and she said, Floyd, I looked over and I saw a little person and mm. they had like a, a broom or something and they were sweeping. And she said, she said she was stunned. She couldn't believe it. Mm. And she looks over at her niece and is like, are you, are you seeing mm. what I'm seeing? And her niece mm. goes, yeah, it's a little person. And, and so by they, little people, to, just to make clear, that ain't like a midget or something. No, like that. no, 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 no. This is like a, much a, smaller, a, much smaller, and evenly proportioned. You know how mm. some, you know how some uh, yeah, midgets right. or dwarves, they're kind of right, little right. disproportionate in their anatomy. This was, pro it was all proportional. And wow. and she and said, does when she, she remember anything about the clothing? Sorry, um, she didn't. She didn't get into details about the clothing. She said it had a broom and it was like yeah. it was sweeping. And she said she could kind of almost see through it. She wow. said she could almost really see almost through it. Almost transparent. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then what? And then it disappeared. It just, it, really? it, it showed up for a short time. And yeah. I think it acknowledged her. I think she said it acknowledged her. Like it looked up at her, like yeah. it looked up over at them. And then it just kind of went back to doing what it Isn't was doing. It absolutely mind blowing to just accept for a second that there might be a kind of a race existing next to us simultaneously. That's always been hiding and always stayed around at the same time, man. Yeah. If you think about it, that can give a great, you know, explanation to all kinds of myths about the spirits of homes. How do you call those spirits? You know, because in a lot of Slavic tradition, we mm -hmm. say here that each house has this spirit like a home, not really like a home elf, mm -hmm. but yeah, brownie, like brownie. Do yes, you I've heard, heard that, that term. term. Yeah, I've yeah, heard that brownie. term. Yeah. yeah. 
And do, do, now, in your culture, do do they do people leave food out for them? I used or to leave do it in my childhood. I was so obsessed with that. Yeah. So my, yeah. my mother told me, "Yeah, well, you better leave some food to him because he might, you know, we we may we may want to make him kind to us and stuff like that." See, so that's that nothing. Yeah. Very interesting because do you know the Native American traditions? A lot of them would do that too. The they would leave area. food yeah. out near the edge of the forest uh, where they food. allegedly live, or they would leave some tobacco. They would leave tobacco oh, shit, or, or really? an offering, an offering wow. to them. Yeah. So those guys, you think they might have been smoking tobacco? Bro, I got a lot of tobacco on my offer, so I mean, that would be wise to smoke some with them. <laughs> yeah. you know, I know the Native, Ameri- <laughs> the Native Americans love smoking tobacco, so yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, you know, just for the sake of argument, let's try to imagine the counter-argument to that. What could be like a conventional you know, standard version of explanation, like why people been living food and trying to, do you think it's something kind of subconscious or maybe it connects to some animals or something? Yeah, it could very well be a, a, a subconscious yeah. thing. Here, here is my thoughts. So we do have in the, in the archaeological record that there were little people, uh, and that's from Indonesia. We actually have the skeletons. We have artifacts that, that proved that these little people once walked the planet at some point. Now, my thought is that Indonesia probably wasn't the only place where these people were. There were mm-hmm. probably other remnants, all, maybe throughout the world, definitely mm-hmm. in North America, because the Native Americans talk a lot about the little people. And so maybe at one point there was a race of these little people and there were interactions with them. And then they, mm-hmm. you know, they were killed off or they died out. But that tradition is still within those tribes. Okay. And so they kind of carry on that tradition Mm, of these people, just like with the giants as well. I believe that there were there were giants that existed. And in fact, in the archaeological record, we're starting to find evidence. Uh, Have you heard of the Denise events? Mm -mm, Okay, this is the Denise events. This was a discovery made in 2010 in the mountains of Siberia. At this at this cave, they were doing excavations, and archaeologists found a couple of huge teeth, and they were they looked like human teeth, but they were so big they were twice the size of a normal human tooth. Mm-hmm. And when the archaeologists first saw them, they thought, "Is this a human tooth or is this a cave bear tooth?" Mm-hmm. And then they found some artifacts. They found a bracelet a stone bracelet that had little eight millimeter holes drilled in it uh, probably had um, at one point had some type of string or thread through the holes that had decorations. Now the bones dated back, the artifacts dated back 40 or 50,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when they started doing the testing on the bones, they determined that they were another species of us. Like we know about Neanderthal and we know, you know, you know that most of us have Neanderthal DNA in us. Mm -hmm because there were interbreeding of Neanderthal and our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So now they've determined this other uh, branch of humanity, they call them the Denisovans, and now they're finding traces of Denisovan DNA in in tribes in Papua New Guinea, in Native American peoples, and and some peoples in Asia and over in Europe too. And a skull was recently found in China. They call it Homo Longi, which means dragon skull. And it's an enormous skull of a Denisovan. It was found in the late 1930s. Uh, a Chinese um, worker found this and he hid it. He put it in a well and didn't tell anybody about it until he was on his deathbed. Then he told his children, hey, and I found this skull. And why do you think skull. he was keeping it? Um, well, because at that, it well, it be, because at that time... Uh, in the in the 30s, Jap- the Japan had occupied that section of China, and so this this guy was forced labor by the by the Japanese to build a bridge, and he came across the skull, and maybe he thought, you know, if he revealed it, that the Japanese would take the skull away, and he would he would never see it, so he hid it, and so on his deathbed, um, he revealed where it was. They recovered the skull and brought it to university, and then it, the DNA testing was done on it. And it was determined it was a Denisovan. And now based upon the skull and the other bone fragments that have been discovered, 
researchers now think that this other lineage, this other branch of us, the average height of them, they said, could have been around seven and a half feet tall. Oh, and that's okay. that's okay. average height. So technically, that would that would really be a giant, especially, you know, back in ancient times, you're talking people were maybe what, five, 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 six, mm -hmm. maybe a real tall person, a rare person might be six foot tall. But we're talking these people on average were seven and a half feet tall and they were very big they were very broad their skulls were shaped kind of like a football and they had big brow ridges massive jaw bones so you could easily see like wow yeah those were giants and some of these ancient peoples interacting with them they would say those those are giants mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if they didn't stay around somehow surprisingly miraculously well then definitely probably that was the sort of you know like interaction between like regular sized people and them and that's why some people currently probably might might lean a little bit closer to that sort of type of body perhaps i think that could be explained like that yeah and there was interbreeding and so yeah. so pe there's populations today that have denisovan yeah. dna in them now speaking about because you know we we've said a lot about uh dating i mean a, a lot about when certain discovery was done and how mm -hmm. they dated back to certain year yeah. what do you know have you looked into how because i've heard recently about the flaws of this dating of carbon dating have you looked yeah. into all the problems that comes that come with um you know understanding how well a certain artifact is Oh, have you looked into it? Yeah, not ex not extensively, mm -hmm. not extensively. Um, you know, uh, the, I know obviously. So, well, supposedly the dating has improved over yeah. over the, the you know decades. It's it's improved, right. but it kind of depends on on what the you know what the artifact is. Are you talking about testing you know human bones? Are you talking about an actual artifact um and you know there's some people that say you know yeah we don't we don't have we don't know for certain you know um you know what you know what we're told by archaeologists is not a hundred percent a hundred percent certain so i haven't looked extensively into that yeah well a lot of people complain about this carbon date and saying that it kind of when it comes to fossil date in that we, you, you kind of measure what is surrounding that fossil or something like that. But, you know, even if that thing is flawed, still doesn't disprove the fact that the fossil itself has been found, you know, and that it is of yes. a size, that it is of a size, right? Yeah, even the, even the date, the, even the, the dating of our Earth itself, and some people will make arguments that there were cataclysms yeah. here on this planet, mm -hmm. and that could really throw off the geological record that it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a simple thing. You know, because if there were massive um, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, if a comet, you know, um, Graham Hancock talks about a comet hitting our planet about 13,000 years ago and breaking into fragments and striking North America and Europe and doing extensive damage to this planet and hitting the ice caps and then the water levels raise up and then there's global flooding. And so, yeah, I mean, our, our planet is geologically scarred from these potential cataclysms like mm -hmm. an, like a comet uh, comet hit how old were you when you first had your journey over somewhere when what, what was your first like trip to some place like peru maybe or something like that how oh old were you and what well I, I haven't been to peru that would definitely be yeah. my if i were to go anywhere on the planet I, again it would be it would definitely be yeah. peru um i i started traveling um i never even flew on a plane until i was like in my probably um mid 30s or late 30s i took a trip to ireland with my family mm -hmm. with my mom and my niece at the time and um i just loved ancient history and i was i really got into the knights templar researching knights mm -hmm. templar freemasonry i mean i was into all all kinds of secret societies all this stuff so any any country that i traveled to i wanted to go find some unusual places so when i was in in ireland i went to some templar uh templar places uh, associated with the knights templar um and i started traveling went to um germany traveled to germany a lot and saw some places over there i went to austria and saw the um the spear of destiny have you ever heard of that Mm -mm. No, it's, it's supposedly the, the 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 spear that pierced the side of christ at the crucifixion mm -hmm. 
And Hitler was obsessed with with a lot of artifacts, but that was one of them, the Spear of Destiny. And when he um, when he came to power and he annexed Austria, he mm-hmm. took possession of a lot of the, the museums and stuff over there. And he knew about the the uh, Spear of Destiny. It was in the Habsburg uh, Museum, and he confiscated that because he believed if he possessed these relics of power, that that would give him the edge in mm-hmm. in the war. He was heavily into the occult. He was heavily mm-hmm. into theosophy, and he was he was into some deep dark stuff that a lot of the history books you'll never hear about. I mean, there are some researchers that get into that, but it's not, um, it's not a common those, topic. Do you think that talk, those rumors about Nazis doing uh, literally some wild bio experiments on people, do you think it's not that? Not, it's not very, that very possible, very yeah. likely. They were they were doing some just- And that spear, is it, is it still preserved in some kind of museum? Over there it is it's it's actually back in austria i saw it when i was over there and it's got a a, a nail that's wired around the, the blade of the spear and it's allegedly one of the nails from the crucifixion mm. is what's believed okay that's interesting i thought now i'm thinking i might have heard about something that basically one of the if not the only real evidence of Christ's existence might have been uh, some kind of a cape that's also preserved some way in some uh, museum or something like that, or like the like the sh- not the shadow, but you know what I'm talking about, like the shroud of the Turin, floor. the shroud yeah, of Turin, that might have yeah, been, that might yeah, been. that has the outline that of the exactly? body. That yes, that, that's yeah, it. The the shroud of, of the Turin, yeah. yeah, yeah. So how did that come on on, on stage? Like, what what's the story behind that? Do you know what on the shroud of Turin? Yeah. Um, I I I think that it was br- it was actually brought forth by a Knight Templar. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think it was, his name was Jeffrey D. Charnay, if I remember correctly. He was a Knight Templar. I don't know. Do you know much about the Knights Templar? No, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if I know much about Templars. I yeah. think I might be mistaken. I would, is that like this? I mean, that's going to be a stupid comparison, but you know, I've been playing some Assassin's Creed and those are like... The they have, name. they actually have, yeah. care, I, I'm not a big video game player, yeah. but they do, they have Templars yeah. in, right, right, in the like game. Like a secret society that's always been uh, opposing yes. uh, those assassins. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's like okay. what, uh, I, I, it was like 1000 AD or or, or mm-hmm. maybe it was 1050 a, AD is when the Templar Order was founded. And the uh-huh. Templars were the, the elite fighting force of Europe. They were knights, but they were also monks. So they had mm-hmm. to take the vows of monks, but they were trained mm-hmm. as warriors. And, mm-hmm. and basically what they did is uh, the Templars went to the, uh, to help, allegedly help protect the pilgrim pilgrims that were going to the holy land and to protect them from bandits and from you know from the muslim attacks and so they set up a um, their their stronghold there allegedly um, over the site of king solomon's temple which now i think that site is um Al- alaska mosque which is one of the most holy sites amongst christians amongst the muslims and the jews but allegedly at one point that was the site of the, t- the the temple of King Solomon, and there are tunnels underneath there. And some researchers believe that the Templars, when they were over there, they knew that there that these tunnels existed, and there were artifacts and sacred knowledge that was there. And they they found that knowledge and they brought it back to Europe. And so this small order of poor knights, all of a sudden, all the royal families of Europe were sending their 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 best sons and donating all this money and then the templar order grew to be incredibly powerful and they were actually some of the first bankers they set up some of the first banks in europe they had so much money and so much property that um you could take your money and you could go to one of their strongholds and 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 deposit it and they would give you they would have a a parchment with a code they would have a code and they would give that to you. And then you can go anywhere in the world to one of their other strongholds and give that code at the stronghold. They would be able to decipher it and then they would oh, be yeah, able to give you your money. First internet banking almost. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So there's a lot of interesting stuff about them as far as. And this, one of them, you said one of them was involved in that. Uh, that in the case, Shroud of uh, Turin. Yeah, he he brought he brought the Shroud of Turin uh, forth. And I think his name was Jeffrey de Charnay. He was a Knights Templar. And so if that's the case, it kind of connects to the whole um, 
belief that the Templars had these holy relics. Some people believe they had the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and uh, these other artifacts that they obtained when they were over in the Middle East that they found at the uh, in those tunnels under the alleged King Solomon's temple. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's fascinating because that also it's always nice to imagine how those supposed events, because you know there's still been a lot of debates whether the figure of Christ has been was real or not. But yes. just to possibly imagine that there might be this link that would connect the past and the present that we still preserve, that's totally, you know, mind blowing. That's well, this is really nice. gonna blow your mind because in my book and 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 some of these subjects are really um, unusual. And when I first started doing the research, I couldn't believe how some of them connected with each other. So for example, uh in one of the archaeological discoveries at Lovelock Cave, they found these these giant bones, these remains of these giant people that had red hair. And the Native American peoples around that area, they they in their tradition, they said, yeah, there was these red haired giants that lived in the area and they were attacking our tribes and they were cannibalistic. They would actually oh, eat shit. their victims. They were very evil. And so finally, the Paiutes banded together with other tribes and they said we got to exterminate them mm -hmm. and there was a war that lasted three years and finally they oh, cornered shit. yeah they cornered the last of the giants in this cave and they threw brush in front of the cave and then they lit flaming arrows and mm -hmm. shot them and burnt the giants to death well 19 wow. yeah 1911 there were some miners that were excavating that cave and they found these giant skeletons and they found um, all types of artifacts now the skeletons wow. disappeared the artifacts were distributed to some museums and and then allegedly a few of the skulls ended up in a small museum that were kept in the basement and they never even put them on public display. They kept them in the basement. If you wanted to see them, you had to ask the curator and the curator would take you downstairs and open up wow. a cupboard. And there was these little, little skull or not little skulls. They were giant skulls right. in this, uh, in this cupboard. And so what's fascinating is I was looking at the archeological reports on this discovery and they mentioned, yeah, there were some giant mummies found and one of them was actually donated to a fraternal organization in that area uh -huh. and I, for for ritual purpose it even said in the archaeologist report it was donated to a fraternal organization to be boiled and used uh in a, a ri ritual initiation purpose and i thought what on earth yeah. like why yeah, are they kind of... why are they doing that yeah and i researched Whoa. that and i actually found out that in that particular area I actually contacted the uh, historical uh, records department in that yeah. in that area, and I said, "Were there? Can you please tell me what fraternal organizations yeah. were in that area in the early 1900s?" And they basically said, "Yeah, there was a, a Freemason lodge, you know, that's still here in this area." And mm -hmm. so I thought, "That's so weird. Like, what would they? What would they be doing with?" So with it all the, kind of connects, right? right? It on, connects. On a weird level. And then I started looking into rituals in uh, in masonry that involves yeah. human bones, and I actually yeah. started finding evidence that there are rituals that involve the use of of skeletal remains. For what purpose? What could be the application of those rituals? According okay, to so those I traditions? actually okay, so when I researched this, there were actually some lodges in um, Australia that got busted, Masonic lodges, because yeah. there were construction work in the lodge, and and some of these workers found human skulls, and so they contacted the authorities, like, hey, we've yeah. got human skulls here, and then they law the um, you know law enforcement went out and did an investigation. And determined that these skeletons were old Aboriginal skeletons, like go going back hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And what the Freemasons were saying, their their reasoning was, oh, we just use those skulls in our rituals to um, they're symbolic because um, we want to uh, emphasize with people like the the important use of their time like you know how mm -hmm. how time is fleeting right like we're here like in a short yeah, time and then, and then we're gone so they would use this is what they claim that they would use the skeletons to to in their rituals well, to kind nobody of nobody would have said the truth who knows exactly the exactly the so that's what they say now what other... do you think they were doing like where if you had to guess your wildest supposition what do you think do you think that were boiling and drinking something from that one or you think they were trying to resurrect somebody you know what um 
That is a good question, but the more research I've done into it, I, I believe that the Freemasons, well, they actually say, they actually say uh, that their knowledge comes from the ancient mystery schools that go back to ancient Egypt, that this it's been this continual line of knowledge that has been passed on to the present day. And that's where the Templars are involved because the Mace, the Freemasons also say that they are connected with the Knights Templar. So you have this lineage of the Knights Templar, and then they eventually kind of morphed from the Templars and they became the Freemasons. And they claim this knowledge that goes back to ancient, the ancient mystery schools. So what do I believe? I believe that, um, they use these bones. I don't know exactly what they do with them, but it's connected with some of these rituals that go back mm -hmm. to the ancient mystery schools. We're talking thousands, thousands of years back. Mm -hmm. And would you say that it might possibly hold some practical usage and application for them, for their societies? Or do you think it rather holds just a symbol, symbolic meaning than merely I, the symbolism? Yes, I think, um, I think, well, they'll claim that it's a symbolism that it, it, it represents a symbolism. However, I think at the upper levels of masonry, I think most of most of the people that are involved in that, they don't they don't know what's really the the, the what's called the secret of masonry. And the secret yeah. of masonry yeah. basically is this. They they have a Gnostic. Have you heard of the Gnostics? Uh-uh. Gnostics, Gnostics, you mean no, Gnostics. Gnostics, but Gnostics. No. Yeah, Gnostics are they called Gnosis, Gnosis meaning yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, they okay. So they go back to um, to ancient times, even even the pre pre Christian uh, pre Christian times, and they believe that they had like a a secret knowledge of of the universe, and so the Freemasons, their belief is at the highest levels that God is as we know of God in the from a biblical sense is the bad guy. And that Lucifer is the good guy mm. because Lucifer, in their view, Lucifer is the one that tried to liberate us. He, he gave us knowledge. It goes back to what? The tree of knowledge goes back to the Garden of Eden, mm. you know, where they, God said, don't eat of the fruit of this tree, mm. you know, because then you'll know good and evil. Mm. And then, you know, you have the whole Adam and Eve thing and Eve took, mm. takes the apple and, and then she eats of it and gives it uh, to Adam and they eat. And then it, it kind of, it kind of breaks that breaks that law that God gave. That story, not to, no, not to interrupt you, but that story, yeah. you know, I don't like how a lot of people easily discard that story. And, you know, yes. I mean, I'm not particularly religious, but even I can yes. sense that there's a lot of hidden wisdom. A lot of hidden. Form. You're precisely yeah. right. Whether you're Christian or non, whether Christian or non-Christian, there's a lot of, of knowledge, uh, symbolism in that, in that story. And so their belief is that, that, that God is the bad one, that God wanted to keep us ignorant, and that Lucifer is the one that gave us knowledge that wanted to liberate us. So that's, that's they, they reverse it. They flip it. They say, mm -hmm. Satan is the good guy. Lucifer is the good guy. God is the bad guy. Mm -hmm. So at the highest levels of that secret society, I believe that that's, that's their view. That's their view. But most members, a lot of members do not know that. You don't find that out until you're at the upper levels and then mm. that is that is revealed to you. I don't even know how you get involved with masonry, honestly. But I do you have to be you time. have to be you have to be invited. You have to yeah, know someone okay. and you have yeah. to be in, you have to be invited in. And, and what each... is that purpose? Because you know you keep hearing, oh, he were, he's a Freemason, he's a Freemason, this is a Freemason, he's a Freemason. She's... Yeah. So what do they do like on average? Do you do you know what is the purpose of those? community societies because we've recently had i mean we i keep hearing that oh this relatively famous guy he appears to be a freemason yeah. and everybody yeah. goes like oh wow but nobody really knows what they do well, no one really knows <clears throat> yeah i mean there's there's a fraternal side of the freemasons and and there is like a community side where they where they do good for the community and you know i you scratch my back i scratch your back mm -hmm. if you're in the club you help mm -hmm. me out I'll help you out and we'll do some things for our community. So there is an aspect that, you know, um, I think some people look at and go, oh yeah, they're, you know, they're good because they're doing stuff 
for their their community and that type of thing. But I think it, underneath that, there's an esoteric side of it, a deeper side of it that gets into ritualistic. The, it gets right. ritualistic. That gets into that whole revelation of you know that Lucifer is the light bearer, that he is the、oh, liberator. Interesting, which kind of borders on some sect level. A lot of people outside the circle would assume, right? Yes, and probably yes. that's partly the reason why they gotta be hidden.、Uh, they gotta stay in shape because a lot of people might not appreciate it, to say the least. Ab- absolutely, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's it's so interesting how it ties together. Have you heard of the Book of Enoch?、Mm-mm, nope. No. Okay, so the Book of Enoch、um, is an ancient ancient biblical text, and it was left out of the the canonized version of the Bible as we know it. So those there's other books that have not been included in、okay. in the Bible as we know it, and the Book of Enoch was one of them, and it's actually a very fascinating、uh, book. If you get a chance, I'd encourage you to read it. But if 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 in Genesis in the in the Book of Genesis in the Bible, there's an interesting passage in there. It's Genesis six, and it's and it says this, and I'll paraphrase it. It says there were giants in the earth in those days and thereafter. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore them children, and those children became mighty men, men of renown. So that's a, exactly that theory. What is it called? Panspermi, spermio, something like you know, when yeah, interbreeding of humans. Kind of interbreeding, like DNA, right? Like some, like a foreign DNA comes in and 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 and, and, inter- and intermixes, right? Yeah, but, But this goes very deep. Now, this isn't just panspermia, like you know, some DNA on a on a on an asteroid that hits the Earth, you know, hits our planet and then evolves. What we're talking about here is you. I've studied this, so when you break this passage down, you got to ask yourself: Well, who are the sons of God? Like,、mm-hmm. what is the Bible talking about when it says sons of God? And so, when you look deeply in the Bible, you will find different passages.、Uh, I think in in Jude,、uh, there's there's a, a a passage in there where Satan comes before God, his throne, and he's accompanied by it says the sons of God. Right,、mm. so those aren't humans that are with him.、Mm. Those are those are、uh, celestial beings that、mm. it's referring to, right? And、wow. then there's another passage in Jude that says,、uh, "When God created the foundations of the、mm. earth, the sons of God shouted for joy." Well,、mm. I'm sorry, but the but allegedly humans weren't even created. So who were the sons of God that shouted、mm. for joy at the creation of the foundation of the earth? That's crazy. They were、wow. angels. They were angels.、Mm-hmm. They were angels. And so, what I've discovered in my research is that Genesis six is talking about a group of angels that came here. Mm-hmm. These celestial beings, and, and by end- angels, do you now make out? Do you make them out to be aliens or some sort of、uh, more like of unknown nature, more of、yeah. a religious nature, or do you think that could have been explained anyhow rationally? Like, because you know a lot, like ancient people, they would they would tend to call angels anything that they could probably saw in the per- sky. They per- would probably. Precisely, an engine or something. Yeah, pr- precisely. So, so here, here's the thing.、Um, so, if they are beings that are coming, if they're not of the earth, by definition, if they're not from the earth,、mm-hmm. yeah, and they're coming to the earth, technically, I mean, if you get real basic, what would that make? Kind of celestial, right? Yeah, celestial, extraterrestrial, right? They're not of the earth, whether you call it an ET or an angel. And do you think now the daughters of Man, how how did they? How was it named? Daughters of men. Daughters of direct, men. Daughters so, of men. You think that directly refers to humans? They they inter. I believe they interbred with humans. And in the book of Enoch, it it's the whole backstory. It is the whole backstory of that little passage, and it talks about a group of these. Angels, they called them the Watchers. There was a group、uh-huh. of two hundred of them that were that came down to the planet, and they found that the women of the Earth fair. They were attracted to the women of the Earth, and they made a pact with each other to have sex with these women. And so, not only did they have sex with the Earth women, but they they taught、uh, they they gave humankind these this forbidden knowledge、mm-hmm. that we weren't supposed to that God didn't want us to have. 
and and the whole book of Enoch gets very deeply into that. And they even and named now it was excluded from the. Uh, it was excluded. It was excluded from the canonized version of the Bible. And so what the book of Enoch says is that this group came down, they interbred with the women, and they gave us knowledge that we weren't supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And then the women that were impregnated by these beings. They had their their babies. They became giants. They were these mm -hmm. giant monstrosities, mm -hmm. and they were called the Nephilim. And Nephilim mm -hmm. is a Proto Hebrew word meaning fallen ones. And mm -hmm. these giants were evil. They they were um, destroying the planet. They were killing humans. They were fighting amongst them, themselves. They were drinking human blood. They were drinking the blood, and some people believe that the the kind of the origin of the vampire mm -hmm. of the blood drinking actually originally originated with the nephilim because they would drink the blood, mm -hmm. and so they were destroying the planet, and then and then God saw what was happening, and so he he wanted to destroy these these giants, these nephilim that were destroying the planet, and so he sent the great flood to wipe them out. To mm. kill the giants. And so when you get into gen that little section in Genesis 6, it said there were giants in the earth in those days and thereafter. I believe where it says and thereafter, that means that some of the giants survived. Not all of them were killed. Because if you look in the Bible, we, we hear about giants in the Bible, uh, David and Goliath. Most people are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. If you look in the Bible, it talks about Goliath and that he was of the bloodline. He was of the bloodline of the Rephaim, which are connected to the Nephilim. So he was mm -hmm. he was a, he was related to that that um, race of giants. Mm -hmm. And there was also another king in the Bible, King Og of Bashan, who was a giant, and he had a bed that was thirteen feet long by about six feet wide, and it was made of iron, allegedly to support his frame because he was mm -hmm. he was so okay. massive. To, to support him now what about the origin of this book of enoch or whatever you call it how did it come and forth how was it discovered do you do you know anything uh, do you, have it? you heard of the dead sea scrolls uh-huh yeah it was like in the some, dead it was uh, in the dead sea scrolls the scrolls that preceded the bible supposedly right that some of the oldest yeah it was found there but there were other books there were other there were other copies i think there was an englishman I think it was in the late 1800s that went to Ethiopia because the Ethiopian church, they, they say that the book of Enoch is legitimate. Like this is a legit book. So they didn't leave that out. They didn't leave the book of Enoch out. And so I think there's, there was an English uh, kind of an adventurer guy that uh, in the 1800s, he actually brought a copy of the book of Enoch to, uh, to Europe. Yeah. That's crazy. That's absolutely fascinating. But Isn't have you heard of the, Oh, go ahead. I mean, I was going to say, isn't that a bummer that that book, that arguably the most exciting part of the Bible is not a part of the Bible. You know, it's not yeah. included in there. And why? So now we can get a bit cons conspiracy, sure. you know, oriented. But why do you think it was not included? Because people, okay, so what would have been, you think, if people had known that at one point, supposedly, like, what giants, how do you think that would have affected our trajectory of history and stuff? Why do you think somebody decided to exclude it? Um, well, for a number of reasons. So first off, I think the book was excluded because um, I, I think a lot of the church fathers, actually, there were a number of early church fathers that said the book of Enoch was real. So there was this debate within the church, you know, uh, amongst these theologians, there was like a number of them that said, hey, this is a legitimate, a legitimate book. This is, you know, this is part of the Bible. And other ones said, no, you know, it's, it's not, it's not legit. And so I think that maybe some of the early church fathers were maybe felt very uncomfortable of how people would think when they think of angels, right? When most of us think of angels, uh -huh. I think it's, they've been portrayed as these beautiful, you know, right. good beings. But then if you start going along the line, like, Hey, there was a group of angels that, that were evil and they mm. actually had the ability to corrupt our DNA, our very genetics on this planet. I so think you think a lot that of book people... would have kind of, according to some people, could undermine the biblical image, right? And De I think it, definitely. I think definitely. I think some people were uncomfortable. The church fathers were uncomfortable with mm -hmm. with how that would how that would turn out.
Yeah, and that. even even um, you know from a from an archaeological perspective with the with the whole concept of these giants, you know, a lot of these universities uh, they are taught they teach their their archaeologists their anthropologists a certain paradigm from the very beginning. Like this is how it is, you know, this is what the knowledge we have. This is our box, right? And anything that goes outside of this, it just you filter it out. Right. Mm-hmm. It's it doesn't match our paradigm. So it can't be true. It's it's you know, it's not. Accurate. Yeah, I heard that um, this premise by Graham Hancock. And who was that other dude that was recently on Rogan's with Graham Hancock? This kind of bearded dude who also is into something like that. That later got banned on Rogan. So maybe you know what I'm talking about. I know talking what about. you're talking about. I, I yeah. haven't I haven't I haven't watched much of Rogan, but I, I, I yeah. can't think of the guy's name, but I, I know who you're Yeah, who you're he's also about. man, let me I don't remember what was his his thing. He was saying something may have been about that Amazon rainforest and some and what's hidden underground and something. So anyway, so yeah, one thing that I kinda took out of that podcast is that how crazy people look at you when you try to go out of the standard framework, you know, yes. how it's all been categorized and stand, stand and according to certain lab standards. And that's, you kind of risk a lot of things if you decide to go against certain your whole norms. career, right. your whole so, career, people have lost their career. I actually give an example in my book of a lady that was an anthro- uh, an archaeologist in Mexico back in the 70s and was doing dating on a on a site with human remains and artifacts and she used a number of different dating techniques and determined she said in my opinion these remains go back you know 300 400,000 years which would totally rewrite the history book this was in Mexico and um, and other archaeologists came up to her her name was Virginia Steen McIntyre and they said don't report that because if you if you report that your career is done. They warned they her. They said, "Don't do it." About that. They push back because I think a lot of in resources and money had been invested from their side into precisely theory, right? Precisely. Then, so, so eventually, would you say that everything comes down to like human inability to accept their mistakes? If, Roughly speaking, right? Because you've got to be humble and admit that sometimes you might have been wrong. Right? That's a good point. I think that does play a, a very big role in that. I also, too, I also believe that who control there, – there's a – have you heard of 1984, the book 1984? Mm, by who? 1918. Um, it- no, 1984. 1984. No, I don't think. I okay, so I took. Well, I'll just, I'll just bottom line this. I took a quote from that book, and it said yeah. this. It said, "Those that, um, those that control the past, right. control the future, and those that control the present, control the past." Mm-hmm. So if you can, you know, if you could control the narrative of history, you know that you can use that to mm-hmm. control control people, control people's belief systems. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there's an element of, um, you know, to controlling, using, using history as as a power, power play. Now to balance that out a little bit, have you out of curiosity, expose yourself to some kind of criticism of some of these theories or perhaps Graham Hancock specifically, have you ever encountered anything, any intelligible, reasonable that would criticize or go against his belief? Um, you know, I, I, as far as Graham Hancock goes, um, I, I really think that he's on to something yeah. and I don't think that he's a hundred percent correct. I don't think anybody's a hundred percent correct. Like when I wrote my book, I, I didn't, I never wanted to present it like, okay, this is the, the information, the research I've done. Yeah. This is what happened. Yeah. This is yeah. what happened right, here. Right, this is what right. happened you here. You just present. I present the information. Yeah. I present some possible theories yeah. and leave it up to the reader to make yeah. up their own conclusions. And I cite all my sources in the book. So I show them like where I got this information and I encourage them, go go look yeah. and see where I got this and, and do your own research. And, and maybe you're going to discover some things that, that I missed, you know. Yeah, so, I think that's a healthy attitude. Yeah. That's a one and only reasonable, you know, stance that can be done. Because can we really even discover something that 
would be 100% true. I mean, it's exactly. kind of like will always remain to a certain degree on speculative level. So let's talk a little bit about your book. How, how long has it been out? Because, man, you know, you, you, you got me entirely. I think I'm definitely buying this book. Oh, thank I mean, you so much. Yeah, thank that's you. It's going to be, you know, such a nice compilation of that thing. I think it will bring back those childhood, you know, fascinating moments when I couldn't put an encyclopedia down. Yeah, yeah there's a lot like of pictures. Digitally available? Oh, yeah, um, it's not I mean. digitally it's not digitally available yet um mm. but um you know you can get a hard copy of it there's yeah. lots of pictures okay. and i again i cite all my sources like all mm. the research that i do i cite everything i wanted to uh, the way i wanted to write it was to make it fun to make mm -hmm. it interesting not just super academic where some mm -hmm. people would be like oh this is boring i want to make it fun but i wanted to include that level of there's some academic stuff in here yeah. too and you can you can see where I where I did my research. And how long has it been out? It's been out for about nine months now, for nine and it's months? it's okay. self published. I published yeah. it myself. Oh. And I'd so like I'm, to get into that because you know a lot of people use publishing houses and uh, yeah. editors and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Now in this nine months, how how has it done so far? Do you, are you aware of the feedback or pushback? Do you know any? You um. Know, you know what? Um. You know, I've I've sold hundreds of copies of it. Um. Mm -hmm. Not a not a tremendous amount, and that's yeah. why I want to get out and and promote mm -hmm. doing more podcasts mm -hmm. and things. Um. I have had some feedback on Amazon. I think the first two, the first three ratings I got were five stars, really okay. positive. And then someone recently gave me a two star oh. and they were, they, they, it seemed like they, um, it seemed like they were kind of, um, expecting my book to be just about like the red haired mm -hmm. giants. Like mm -hmm. they got that impression that that's all the book was about. And it's mm -hmm. not, there's like the first maybe 130 pages is yeah, about on your profile. You give a brief description of articles yeah. or paragraphs, right? So it's, uh, yes. I'm aware that it's a, in a compilation form. It's a compilation. And I, and I think that the feedback of this particular individual, um, you know, maybe they were under the impression that it was a book just about the red haired giants. And so their criticism was, Hey, you know, your first hundred pages, you were about the giants. And then you started getting into all this right, other right, stuff. Yeah. And of course, you know, anytime you put yourself out there, there's going to be yeah, criticism. Yeah, not, yeah, not everyone's yeah. going to like what you yeah, do. And, yeah. and that's, that's fine. That requires I mean, that's certain just... bravery to put yourself out in any yeah. regards, in any respects. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so far, um, I mean, yeah, I've been having fun with it, just doing podcasts right. and and um, a learning. Like every person yeah. I talk with, I learn. I learn something. Have you thought about running your own podcast, or if you do already? Um, I, I maybe in the future that's a possibility to do. Because that. that would be nice. That would be nice. That would give you a lot of freedom. I feel like you know, a lot yes. of freedom. You can structure it the way you want. And it's not that you know, financially demanding and time consuming right. and not, not too crazy. I would imagine the book must have consumed way more time and perhaps money. So tell me a little bit about like the technical side of writing that book. How does one self publish a book? Okay. So the company that I used is called book baby, yeah. book baby. And I, I was really pleased with, uh, with book baby as far as the support, um, to, to put my book together. I did have a, a friend help me with the editing. Mm -hmm. Um, I've known him since I was a, a young kid and he, he's a writer and mm -hmm. he, he decided, you know, he wanted to help me on the project. So he did some of the editing and then he introduced me to a friend that, uh, did some of the formatting on my book. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like friends, you know, a friend mm -hmm. and then a friend of a friend that kind of contributed and, and helped me out. So mm -hmm. basically I just spent four years. It took me about four years to write the book, mm -hmm. uh, four years of research. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, it, it would have been much more tricky if it would have just been me doing yeah. that, you know, all mm -hmm. the editing and doing the sure. formatting. Um, that would have been, that would have been a, a lot. And then, so you've got the product, right? Which is a, a finalized, a finalized product. And then you resort to this uh, company, Book Baby, you say, right? And yep. they do what? 
Um, they actually have a bookshop on their website, and um, and so yeah, people could go to their site and then purchase uh, purchase the book. The nice thing about Book Baby is that so my book's uh, twenty dollars, twenty American dollars, and if if I sell a copy through Book Baby, I'll literally get ten dollars for each uh-huh. book, uh-huh. which is which is wonderful. Like if I was with a publisher, and probably I might get a buck, maybe a couple yeah, bucks right, for right. each book sold. But with a publisher, the book possibly would have been more exposed to people, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. on that side of it, then there, as far as um, promoting it and that type of thing. So there are pros and cons with everything. I mean, with a publisher, mm-hmm. uh, one one How reason. How much and, would it cost though to resort to a publisher? Do you, uh, I'm curious to you know. Like, you know, it, it, I, it. I think it varies. I yeah. I didn't look too deeply into it, but I mean, yeah. it, it could run into. You know, thousands. And how much did it cost dollars. you to resort to this company? If oh, it was it was probably. I think I got my. I think the program that I did was like thirteen hundred bucks. I think yeah, something like okay, that. Okay, thirteen or yeah. fourteen hundred bucks. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And you you become an author basically. Yeah. yeah. I've always been curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, I would look at if you're thinking of self-publishing, um, I would look at Book Baby. There's a lot of other things that if you paid a little extra money, like they could help you with promotion and that type of thing as well. So they do offer other other services, you know, for for self-published authors. What's been the most challenging in the process of writing that book? Uh Probably just dealing with life events and yeah, and being yeah. consistent with writing. You know, yeah, I've, I had a lot of like outside things happen, mm-hmm. and then it was always like you know get back to the book, um, you know keep working at this mm-hmm. and and don't stop no matter what's going on outside of your life. You know, you, right. you, you this is a big goal for you. Continue mm-hmm. on. So that was a t- mm-hmm. kind of the tough thing. I had some ups and downs in, in my mm-hmm. in my personal life. So mm-hmm. to just to be consistent and and to mm-hmm. follow through. So yeah, it took me about four years to to do that. But now it must feel really rewarding, doesn't it, for you to know that the book is out, right? And it's it, like it is. It's fun. In a way. Yeah, it's something that I can I can leave that's going to be around when I'm gone. You know, and I really, I hope it inspires other people to get curious and to, um, you know, to go look, uh, read some of the books that I reference in, in, in my book, you know, and kind of further their interest, further their study. Um, have you heard of Coast to Coast AM? I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a huge show in the in, throughout the world. They do UFO stuff, paranormal, um, that type of stuff. And and the host of that is George Norrie. He he's like been doing broadcasting since he was he was a young man. But I just went to an event um, before I I did a podcast with you, mm-hmm. and um, I met him. And after the 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 show that he did, and I had a copy of my book, and I had mm-hmm. signed it for him, and I said I wrote this book. You are a real inspiration. And he goes, oh, he goes, I'm gonna have to get you on my show. Mm-hmm. And I was, and that's one of the reasons, obviously, why I wanted to give him the book. And his assistant was right there. And he looks at his assistant and he goes, make sure that gets on my desk. Really? really yeah. So, nice, you know, nice. will it happen? I don't know. But yeah. I, I've opened up a potential door where I can get on oh, nice. one of the biggest. Man, what a journey, right? Yeah, what a journey yeah. This whole thing yeah. is. Yeah. And that's what where curiosity and genuine fascination obsession with something brings you i believe right and, and connecting with other people here yeah. i am talking to you in ukraine yeah. i i had no no clue i'm like wow <laughs> it just blow, blows my mind you know so yeah. that's beautiful that's beautiful that's yeah. what, that's that thing about doing what you love you will never become successful with something that you hate doing right you can reach certain <laughs> level but if you mean to become truly outstanding in some regard yeah you gotta like it you're absolutely right. And if you have a passion for it, then people see that passion. Like when I've done podcasts and stuff before, people are like, they go, man, you're real passionate about what you do. And it's like, yeah, it's because I love it. It's why I'm talking to you now and it's uh, 121 in the morning yeah, 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 here. Yeah, yeah, it's because yeah, yeah, yeah. I love talking about this stuff. And I love the fact that you're interested and you're curious mm-hmm. about, mm-hmm. you know, my, my research oh, and yeah, work. Like and just what can be yeah. better? That's the privilege of having this goddamn technology called the internet, you know, let's absolutely use it for something cool. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. you you never know what doors you're going to open up mm-hmm. and the people that you meet and the connections that you make. Um, 
I've met some really interesting people. I just at this uh, this event that I went to tonight, I've met I met several people, and they showed me footage uh, of an area out here in Washington where I live. It's a it's a ranch. UFOs, uh, orbs floating in the sky. They said, "Look at this," and and they and this place you could go to this guy's ranch and you could camp. He'll, you pay it money and you can camp there. And so I'm going to be I'm going to be heading out to this. It's called East Seti Ranch uh, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go camping oh, yeah. out there. And who oh, knows? Yeah, nice. Maybe that's I'll nice. see some interesting things in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. And I never would have known about that. Come there? How long oh, maybe a few days. Stay? Yeah, maybe a few days. Yeah. See what happens. So you bring a tent, right? You, 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 you could bring a tent or there. they have yurts there. They have the, those domes, those yurts oh, there. Oh, um nice. They have lodging. I mean, who knows? Like, I, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't met these people going to another event. Sure. And they told me, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll meet well, you out next, there. When you, when you go camping, then make sure your phone's at you. Because, you know, way too many people, they observe something like that, and they don't got a phone. And they don't have a phone. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Make sure your phone's recharged. Right. Yes. Ready to go. But you know what? Even if, even if that I didn't get that phone out yeah, in time yeah. and get it recorded, if I saw it myself, right, right, right. just knowing like, wow, like I, yeah. I saw that I witnessed this. Yeah. Have you, what was maybe if you could recollect something that's been the most mysterious, the most unexplained for you that you've personally witnessed any. Oh my gosh. Like yeah. That? I've no, I've never seen a UFO or anything like that, but I had some paranormal experiences when I was, uh, well, particularly I had two, two experiences. Uh, one was very, um, profound when I was a teenager, uh, me and my parents, we lived in an apartment and we had some friends of the family that would come over regularly and my parents would play cards with them. And the, it was a husband and wife. And the, the lady's name, her name was Patty. And she was a tall lady. She had really big hands. Very nice. Very nice. And when she'd come over, she would knock on the door and it would just be this loud knock. You know, she had these big hands. Boom, 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 boom. And my dad would always tease her. He's like, hey, you're going to, you know, you're going to break the door down. So anyway, they would come over regularly. And uh, one day she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and um, she didn't have too much long, longer to live. And, um, her husband worked driving buses and he didn't want to put her in a care facility while he was at work. And my dad, he was off from work because he had hurt his back. And he said, well, why don't you just drop Patty off over at our place and I will, we'll play cards and I'll watch her. And then when you get off work, you can come pick her up. So they made this arrangement where she would stay with my dad during the day and then her husband would pick her up. Well, one day she was at our apartment and she had a seizure in the in our apartment. She had a seizure and she died. She literally oh, died in the in the apartment. So immediately after her death, we heard we heard this mm -hmm. loud knocking, loud knocking at the front door. We heard loud knocking. We'd open the door and there'd be no one there. We heard loud knocking on the walls. Loud knock or a knock on the window late at night. It'd be a knock on the window. We was go. it one one off one time? Oh no it no no! Repeated? It was repeated. days. It it continued wow, for really? it continued for days after Holy that shit. knocking. And my dad didn't believe in that kind of stuff. But I'll tell yeah. you what, I'll never forget his face when we were sitting in the living room watching TV and there was a loud banging on the door. Right. And he got up. He had this weird look and he opened the door and there was no one there. And I oh, look man. at my dad. I look at my dad's face and he was kind of a tough guy you know yeah. but i looked at his face and he was scared he oh, had this look of like scared sure. but he didn't he didn't want to admit but he yeah. he, had, he was scared well, so this he knew what the hell is going he, on he, right? yeah I mean, yeah he knew but he didn't because you can't really know what's up with that exactly exactly so this continued on and my and we had neighbors next to us and they were an older couple and my mom told her what happened said hey we heard all these weird knocking noises you know we had a friend of the family just pass away in our apartment mm -hmm. and she was a religious lady and she goes well can i come over to your house or your apartment and bless your apartment my mom said sure mm -hmm. so this lady takes a she takes a bible and she's walking through our apartment and she's reading passages of the bible and she's sprinkling holy water mm -hmm. and i was young and i was like i was like this is weird you know so i'm gonna yeah, leave. You precisely was, I was like probably 15, 16. Yeah. Oh, that ain't just, that young though, right? No, not that young. But yeah. I was like, I was kind of weirded out. I was like, this is kind of weird. I'm yeah. going to go hang out with my friends. So I leave. My sister, she stays. And so right. this is what my sister told me. She said, when this lady was reading the passages of the Bible, 
all of a sudden her voice changes the tone of her no voice shit. it changes and she said and she starts speaking in this other voice and she said um she said this she said um this is patty she goes this is patty speaking she goes i don't mean to scare you i'm sorry i didn't mean to scare you guys i just didn't get a chance to say goodbye i just wanted to say goodbye and so she's talking like that and then uh, my sister is just sitting back and she can't believe it she's because her, her tone of her voice and everything oh, changes and then after she did that the lady sprinkled the holy water no more knocking. Nothing. Nothing. <sighs> Nothing after that. Wow. Yeah. Holy shit. I wouldn't, yeah. bro. How could you? How could you have gone playing with your friends? I wouldn't have missed a second. <laughs> well, of that I experience. know. Now I think back on it, I'm like, now oh. I would have been like, oh man, I want to. <laughs> yeah, I want to witness something this. big. I missed right? something big. That's missed just something. like those horror stories when yeah. you know anybody, a priest or anybody who comes to bless the facility gets, yeah. you know, expectedly gets possessed holy shit yeah wow. and, and so i had another experience um this now, was just when, before you go when, into that yeah, yeah, you, yeah you do know that you know it's like a common it's almost like a common occurrence when somebody passes away the the family or the nearest and dearest are almost bound to hear some kind of noises you know i've been exposed to something like that i know really that, that, oh hell yeah yeah, for yeah, sure. yeah. And yeah. that's almost always in the shape or form of sounds and knocks on the wall, on the door, on the window. Well, interesting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. My mother told me when my father had passed away, they had uh, knocks on the windows, you know, that wow. I don't think it was particularly connected to what he would have done before. But, yeah. you know, the sound, the knocks definitely kept going. And that keeps, and I, you know, it makes me think that, you know, how some people say that it's, human is not just a physical form something materialistic that you can touch and feel it's yeah. also like energy and that totally. soul level so something must have been something must remain after the body goes goes away after the body is like deceased. a residual kind of energy there must be something there must be something yeah. i think scientifically if i was a little bit more educated in that topic i would have explained that yeah but you know how yeah, some kind of energy level traces are left after the physical form is gone. Yeah. And that physical and that energy entity or whatever, it must it sometimes it kind of comes on for somehow and it you know, and it does something. And yeah, it's always those knocks and hits. Yeah. It's crazy because certain elements are present in a lot of cultures and families and a lot mm -hmm. of people would report exactly the same thing. And it's crazy because it wasn't just you who heard it. If it's like a individual It was everybody in the house. Yeah, it's always questionable. But then when the whole family can, mm -hmm. can you know, uh, corroborate to it, well, now it's different. Now it's different. So yeah. now, what, what do you think would have happened? Do you think it would have had some kind of ending if not for that lady who came and decided to blast the house? You know, I'm not sure, but I, you know, from what I believe is, I, I believe that what, what she did, did definitely brought closure mm -hmm. to, to that. Mm -hmm. I think maybe if she hadn't done that, uh, we might have experienced a lot more of that. Um, you and, might and have how, seen some, you would have probably seen mm -hmm. something because yeah. I don't think it would have stopped at just knocks. Who knows? Right. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. You know what, me, because I've happened to witness a lot of dead people. I've lost a lot of relatives. And I always okay. think sometimes, like, when, you know, because I'm 25, I ain't, I ain't got to be a pussy, honestly speaking. That ain't the age to, you know, be afraid of staying alone in the house. <laughs> but sometimes you, every now and then, you have some kind of, I'm a big horror movie fan. And especially okay. when I was young, I thought, man, but I always had, I always found some cancellation and peace in the thought that people who passed away were good people. And they yeah. wouldn't want anything bad for me in the first place when they were alive. Yeah. But, you know, it's hard to imagine what would have happened after somebody passes away. So, yeah, yeah. but what a crazy story. Holy shit. Yeah, That's that was insane. that affected me in a really profound, yeah. profound level. And then I had another experience that was not nearly as intense as that. But um, I was driving to uh, Seattle, which is a, a big city. Uh, a few hours away from like three hours away from where I live. And I was driving in the car and I had this thought in my head, like, you're going to get into a car wreck, you know, be careful, be careful. And I was thinking about car crashes, that kind of thing. And I thought, man, this is so weird. Like, why am I, why am I thinking about this? And, um, and anyway, so I made it to Seattle. I did what I had to do there. 
and I was driving back home. I lived in Portland, Oregon at the time, and it was very late at night. And I was getting ready to cross the bridge from Washington to Oregon. And right, and this very late at night, and there was hardly any traffic. I was on the freeway. And again, that thought in my head said, be very careful, be mm-hmm. careful. And, and so, okay, I'm like, all right. And so I, I'm looking and I think I'm seeing these headlights in the mm-hmm. distance. And I'm like, are those headlights? Like, what is this? Like, I'm on the freeway, like getting ready to cross a bridge. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, a car had gotten onto the freeway the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. They were going the wrong way on the freeway. And and if I hadn't been aware, it would have been a head-on collision. Mm-hmm. And But but because I was real hypersensitive, I saw those headlights in the distance, and I, I swerved off to the to the mm-hmm. side, and that car just kept driving down the freeway you know, that going the wrong direction. It intuition i think yeah um, i have seen some sort of semi-scientific explanation of intuition and also mm-hmm. what's called by psychics those people who claim to be able to build yeah. the future yeah it might have been somehow connected to all the experiences that you hold in your dna or something like that you mm-hmm. probably have heard something like that That's like an ancestral why, dna yeah, ancestral kind of thing, yeah. memory or something memory like that. ancestral memory people, yeah uh can predict certain events and see perhaps even foresee the future is somehow something to do with the genetics and DNA. So that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what that was, but it, it, it saved my life. Like mm-hmm. just, you know, uh, it's not something I normally think about when I get in the car, I don't think about, you know, Oh, I'm going to get into a car accident. And so this, this was, uh, you know hours hours of me thinking you know these thoughts you know what i don't like though when uh-huh. something like that happens to some other people how mm-hmm. they catac- how they immediately jump to certain conclusion and they say something yes. like my mother would say something like oh that's my that's my mother trying to warn me or something yeah, like that yeah. and yeah. i mean i respect that i can see that maybe sure. when i get to her age i will probably think something yes, similar yes. right but I just currently, I I'm, I do not appreciate how people quickly jump to conclusion, how they yeah. categorize a lot of stuff. Sure, sure. And I think they do that too based upon their beliefs, right? Mm-hmm. Like what is their belief? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's some people, something about that. Yeah, right? sometimes some people might say, oh, that was a Holy Spirit, you know, mm-hmm. warning me, or that was an angel, or or that was, my, like you said, that was my mom, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. warning me what mm-hmm. was going on. So it's just based on their belief, you know, trying to mm-hmm. trying to rationalize it or... You know. But also generally, I also, I mean, regardless of your religious belief or non-religious mm-hmm. beliefs, sometimes, yeah. you know, you get to talk to people who are so radical in their beliefs, who can yes. completely have lost their ability to stay, to positively stay on the fence. I don't think staying on the fence is necessarily always bad. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you got to remain open-minded to a certain degree. Cause sure. It, there's nothing worse than an absolutely religious person to the core that is yes. absolutely close-minded from any sorts of possibility. But I absolutely. think worse than that is a absolute atheistic kind of person who yes. discards immediately the possibility of anything. Like, come on, what the hell do you know about everything? Because you read a right. bunch of biology books you yeah. know, you listen to a bunch of debates, come on, freaking take some shrooms, you know, go, go get <laughs> sent to Jupiter, right? Let's talk afterwards. Yeah, right? no, it's an excellent point. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about knowledge filtration, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have this paradigm in your head that this is the way things are. And if you encounter anything else that falls outside of that, you just filter it out. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. it can't be like it's. You know. Do you think that people's um tendency that people's uh, inclination to categorize everything according to their belief. Do you think it's something they're born with or like, can, can one, that's a hard question. I'm going to try to form yeah. it. Can one, in your opinion, teach himself how to be a bit more, you know, flexible in his beliefs? I, I think so. I think most of us can. I mean, my, my view is that, you know, we come into this world with the most powerful computer that we'll ever know. And it's right here. It's between, it's between our ears. Now, However, when we come into this world, there's no software program mm-hmm. to it. There's no operating system. So what what becomes our operating system? It becomes our our family upbringing, our uh, our experiences, our person, who we hang out with, mm-hmm. um, traumas that we've experienced. Um, you know, are they are in our culture in which we're raised. Those all those components kind of start to shape and form this operating system the software program can it be updated can it be changed i believe it's absolutely possible to do that Mm -hmm. if that ain't too personal have you had any psychedelics experience and if yes how 
how has okay. that shaped you? Or... Yeah, no, I've not had any psychedelic experience. However, I do have a background in hypnotherapy. Okay. Uh, I've done meditation yeah, and right. hypnosis. So I, I, I have practiced altered states of consciousness without, mm -hmm. without taking any mm -hmm. drugs. Mm -hmm. I, I just do it uh, through the, through meditation. So through hypnosis. you are able to hypnotize a person and you're also like eligible to hypnosis. That means that you get hypnotized. Is that true? Absolutely. All of us go into hypnosis. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. Like some people go, Oh, I can't be hypnotized. Well, mm -hmm. we are natural. We go into natural states of alter consciousness right. Right. on a daily basis. But a lot of people I think don't it's just mostly realize. not what people imagine it to be. Because exactly. The picture Precisely. is like you, you sit like as if in trance, right? And Yes. It's so interesting. I have a little diagram that I actually drew up. I, I, me and my friend had a conversation about this. I don't know if you could, mm -hmm. how well you yeah, can yeah. see this, but this is a, this is an iceberg and this mm -hmm. represents our, our mind. And mm -hmm. so this represents the water. So above the, above the surface, you just see this little chunk, but really what lies below the surface, there's a whole mountain underneath there. And so the, the part that's above the wa the surface, that's our analytical mind. Mm -hmm. And we use that for analyzing, thinking, planning, and it's our short-term memory, mm -hmm. right? We use that on a daily basis. But what what lies underneath the surface, this huge mountain underneath here, is we start to get into the subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And the subconscious and mind, past programming, life experiences, yeah. our beliefs, traumas that we've experienced, mm -hmm. uh, memories of our experiences, uh, our autonomic nervous system in our body that, you know, how the mind and body connects. Um, yeah. It's emotional part of our mind. And, yeah. and so this is a huge uh, part of our behavior, mm -hmm. right? This influences us on a tremendous level. So when we go into these altered states of consciousness, when we're at a, at a, at a what's called beta, our brain waves are operating at a certain frequency. So when we're at beta, our, our, our frequency is at a higher level, right? So, so we're in the analytical part of our mind. But as we become more, um, more relaxed, say, for example, watching television mm -hmm. or watching a movie or maybe reading a really good book, mm -hmm. um, that type of thing, or even listening to sometimes listening to music, right? Music is very hypnotic. Mm -hmm. you, your brain waves start to slow down and you get into what's called alpha state, which is a light state of hypnosis. And then you can get you can drop down further into what's called theta level, mm -hmm. where you go into a deeper level of hypnosis. And then obviously the next level is delta, which is sleep, which we all mm -hmm. obviously all we all do that. What so is in between uh, delta? What is the so, yeah the middle? Oh one. theta. Theta. Yeah. How, theta, how does that, one theta? So right? so theta you can theta you can access through uh, deep levels of meditation. Uh -huh. and deep levels of, of hypnosis right okay. alpha level we constantly go into alpha level that's a light hypnosis state and again watch a movie right mm -hmm. watch a movie read a good book yeah being um, engaged in some activity be, brain activity. yes and so even at a light state of hypnosis you start to be able to influence this stuff down here down below and that's mm -hmm. why advertisers spend so much money on on advertisement because in a in a in a form in a way it is a form of hypnosis. They use um, emotional imagery. They use music. Um, I was just and, going yeah. to ask you if you would add uh, dreams to that part below the surface. Absolutely. Because you know, strangely, yes. I've been thinking about that's one thing that I've reached and then I've been playing uh, this concept. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm proud to announce that it's not been posed on me by anybody and anything because being exposed to so many sources of information living in this yeah. digital environment we don't even know yeah, yeah. what concepts are truly ours and what not but that yeah. doesn't probably even matter at the end of the day yeah. as long as it serves any purpose so i thought you know it's strange how sometimes we got used to thinking that our reality shapes our dreams in terms mm -hmm. of like okay we've had a day something happened that and then we have some kind yeah. of weird um representation of what happened during the day in our dream but now i think that strangely maybe our dreams shape our reality you know because who knows yeah 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 and then i've just been thinking about that because maybe what we see in a dream we tend to subconsciously represent in our reality not vice versa it's just one thing that i've been thinking of. that's very very interesting I've and that's some... something that we have no control of, right? Because you, I mean, some people practice those lucid dreams. When lucid dreaming, yes, right. yes. But I actually experimented like with control. that. 
I actually yeah. experimented with, uh, as far as uh, I did a short experiment of seeing if I could remember my dreams. Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is I would keep a journal next to my bed. Mm -hmm. And right before I went to bed, I would get myself uh, into a hypnotic state, which mm -hmm. is easy to do because you're already starting to get relaxed and start mm -hmm. to, you know, drift down into sleep. And I just gave myself suggestions. I said, you know, I will remember my dreams. You know, I will remember my dreams tonight. I will remember my dreams tonight. And so when I was doing this experiment, I would go to sleep and I remember starting to dream and then I would be able to consciously wake myself up and mm -hmm. I would write down very quickly mm -hmm. so, part so of what I force yourself to wake up, right? Force myself to wake up and I would write because a lot of times, you know, when you dream, you know, you remember certain parts, but there, you know, there's a lot of parts that you do not yeah, remember yeah, that you don't yeah, recall, yeah. like little bits and pieces. And so I would write down little key things right. and then I would go back to sleep. And then again, I would start to dream. And then I would open up my eyes, wake up. And have right you ever up. tried to, when you understand it's a dream, to do something else rather than wake up? Have you tried to, you know, have Yes, fun? I have. Yeah, I've actually, and, and sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't yeah. worked in the dream, you know, like, oh, like this is happening and I'm going to force myself to do this or do that. And There are certain things and actions in the dream that cannot ever be done or... I should not say ever, but very hard mm -hmm. to get done. And I feel like sooner or later, one guy has to write some physics books, like physics textbook about laws of physics within a dream. Like good luck to turning on the light or turning off the light right. you know, in a dream. You pinch your nose like that. You can breathe in your dream through your nose. You can probably do some crazy. It's absolutely impossible to read the text in a dream or to look at your watch right. and you know make out yeah. what time it is yeah like listen good luck reading the text in a dream right yeah. and i wonder i wonder what that is why what right. mechanisms are because there must be something part, some kind of parts of our reality because in reality if you see the text like like how can you test your reality read the text you know it's like if right. you can read something intelligibly good good sign that you probably ain't sleeping in a dream it's impossible so i wonder what do you think that makes what what is that that m makes us totally incapable of reading texts in a dream what that that is a good question i yeah, have like, i have no i have no idea uh that is i never even thought about that yeah. like no yeah really impossible next time when you yeah. when uh, a bit of consciousness spikes in your dream I challenge yeah. you to read the text or to look at your watch or to look yeah. at your phone in a dream. You will see all kinds of horseshit, you know, all right. kinds of madness. And wow. it's crazy. And I wonder what that could be. What that right. could be. Now, it's obviously connected to some kind of, I don't know, maybe your brain kind of plays with you, messes with you a little bit and reminds you that, hey, 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 you know, things are different here. Maybe exactly. it's actually the only reason for having dreams. Because I would be right, wouldn't I, when I said, if I said that, we still don't quite know, aren't entirely sure the purpose of a dream, like the practical. Right, yeah. I, think yeah. I, I think it's studied to a certain degree, but maybe the most important application of a dream is when your brain reminds you of certain scenarios that may be possible in a, like, man, you wake up in the middle of the night in your room, you see a tiger, you know, and your brain's right. like, yeah, well, you better be on your guard, bitch, you know, maybe yeah, tomorrow yeah. you woke up and the tiger will be in your room. <laughs> so maybe it teaches you. It's like a lesson of a little death. You know, yeah. and we just take it, and we don't even because we're so sure that we're gonna wake up, right? So, I don't that's, know, that's it's fascinating. Philosophy. Yeah, interesting. I, I've had I I haven't really had any dreams recently that I could remember. Um, mm -hmm. I take high high absorption magnesium before uh -huh. I go to sleep, and that uh -huh. knocks me out. Like well, really helps nice. really nice. helps me get some good sleep. So yeah. I I haven't had any dreams like quite a while that I could yeah. I could actually recall I and used I'm sure to go hard on lucid dreams a bunch of years Did ago you? I was oh man I've tried there's no method that you I haven't done not really? single fucking technique I haven't tried yeah wow. and I think but the problem is back in the you know I couldn't keep the balance I think the reason why I quit and I am not too you know itchy to return to that practice because sometimes you want to go to sleep and just sleep that's yeah it. that's what we must do that's a psychological you rest, chill out, yeah right but also, that, although there are people who mastered that skill to such a degree that for them, it's like for us, just a simple dream. For them, it's a lucid mm -hmm. dream, effortless. And I never received that. I was too hectic. I was too obsessed with that. And it gave me great results. I've done a lot of wild shit, a lot of wild okay. experiences. And certain techniques work best. You know, there huh. are techniques that can save you like 
listen, fucking one week of nice practice, you can do it on a regular basis. Interesting. You know, certain techniques are really good. Wow. Uh, but it was a good, good experience. I have a lot of um, copy books when I would write down my dreams and now I read it and I think, man, I wish like if, if I mean, I better keep that shit from anybody's eyes because they will send me to a mental hospital straight up. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. right. That was that was a good period. Well, listen, we've done nearly two hours. I'm endlessly grateful for you. You've been oh unbelievably my exciting guest. Honestly, I mean, I've been having all kinds of people, both interesting and otherwise, and you're definitely one of the best, if not the best. It's been oh a, my gosh, thank you very much. Sure. It's been a, f yeah. a fun thing. Like, I'm so glad you reached out to me, and yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, I could sit here and, and talk for hours. Like, for it's sure. almost two in the morning here, yeah, yeah and yeah. I'm just like, hey, you know, we're in this conversation. Conversation. Like I, I can keep going, man. I can yeah. keep going, but I know I do need to rest, and I know you you probably have yeah. other things that you. Oh need yeah, to no, do well. I, I think I will go back to sleep because you know I'm not an early bird. If I wake up nine okay. ten, I mean, yeah, that ain't good. I'm gonna get back to sleep to to sleep deep. Right. Well, thanks well, a well, lot. Thanks you. Thank thank you a lot. That's been a lovely experience, man. I, I'm sure we we will get back to it. Um, yeah, we'll repeat it. I will include in the, you know, I feel only, I, I only feel bad that my audience ain't that big because I feel like guys like you, you, you deserve a bigger channel, bigger exposure and bigger audience. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, make sure to drop me the links via email if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah.